and get into that, um, I want to introduce the two guest artists that are going to be a part of the discussion. Uh, first, Sharice Francis. Uh, Sharice Francis uh, is a writer, um, cultural critic um, based in New York City, and also Will Focus, who is a graphic designer. All this, uh, I know steps are kind of all the way over there, but let me take the shortcut. And Will is an animator, graphic designer, illustrator. Um, is, is it okay to say cartoonist as well? Cartoonist. Whatever's comfortable. <laughs> and so this public discussion was organized and curated by the Black Speculative Arts Movement, uh, specifically uh, Reynaldo Anderson, um, who is um, has kind of uh, been a connection for myself and many others. Uh, artists, thinkers, uh, scholars, um, literally from across the, uh, the African diaspora and also the African continent in Europe uh, and on a global spectrum. Um, so again, to my right is uh, Cherise Francis and then at the far end is Will Focus. So I really thank them for making time to attend and especially for the Black uh, Speculative Arts Movement to kind of curate this public discussion. Um, so. Just to kind of get a show of hands really quickly from uh, audience. How many people have an idea or have heard of Afrofuturism or know what it is or want to know what it is or have no idea what it is, but I'm just like, all right, let's, let's get into it. Somehow, somewhat, some, some, somewhat, okay. All right, cool, that's, that's good to know. All right, so with that i'm gonna let the uh, two guests to my right introduce themselves and also explain their own leanings uh with afrofuturism and kind of just their own work in general to uh kind of give a through line to what we're going to talk about in this discussion hi everyone i'm sharice francis i'm a local queen's poet and literary text artist um, most of my work uh, with Afrofuturism has um, been with my blog, Futuristically Ancient, um, which is now my main website, and um, as well as my work with, uh, with poetry and story writing. Um, basically, I see my poetry as literary experiments. Uh, I like to um, work with etymology and sound and basically break words down into elemental form to recombine them into different compounds and layers of meaning. And um, for me, how my work relates to Afrofuturism is Afrofuturism is the idea of the various possibilities of blackness and um, uh, what blackness means throughout the diaspora and how that can be used as a creative tool to see the various ways of being for us throughout the diaspora. Yeah. That was good. Um, <laughs> hi everybody, my name is Will Focus. Uh, shameless plug, the one Will Focus on all social media. Um, very shameless. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Afrofuturism uh, for me is more uh, conceptual. Um, uh, playing off of what she just said, uh, it's about where we see ourselves in the future, how that is a progression from where we are now and how that's illustrated in different platforms. So for me, uh, I'm an illustrator, but I'm also a graphic and web designer. So mine is twofold where my Afrofuturism stems from. So the first portion is how I actually illustrate black people and black faces. Uh, I take a futuristic tone and approach to how they're represented and how they appear. Um, this is how I envision things in a, a, a very far future. And it also paints us in a different light that's not as commonly seen every day. Uh, my second is I'm a system builder. I believe Afrofuturism is all about positioning and where you're able to place things for the opportunity for advancement in the future. Uh, and in doing so, I create a lot of platforms online that help advance that concept. So um, example, website, uh, melanating.com. It's for the uh, development of, or the display of events that are produced by uh, black and brown people. Our Black Web 
is a black owned business directory that's online as well. Uh, I work in conjunction with uh, Taji Mag, who is actually sitting in the audience and they are a black owned publication. So it's about positioning certain systems so that way we can grow outward as a people. Um, and then on top of that, I also have uh, three children. Uh, my two are in college, currently are going to college for their uh, freshman year. And it's about positioning them so they can take what I've learned and then expanding. And I, I believe it's about growth. And that's what Afrofuturism is for me. Thank you both. Um, to kind of move us forward, uh, with Cherise, your writing, uh, dealing into uh, the speculative mindset and also then taking the stories that have been a part of our diaspora and that were kind of created because of the circumstances in this diaspora. Um, and then I, I really love what you said, Will, about positioning, because for me that is very much in line uh, with um, the physical manifestation of our black bodies um, and in the sense that as an, dance as an art form deals with this real sense of positioning what you see in front of you what is behind you the awareness of space uh, and musicality um, and the, the relationship of that but then at the same time understanding the stories that our bodies hold and how that then is relayed between us sitting here within an audience, uh, within the, in everyone's own history and trajectory of your ancestors, of, your, of our lineage, and where that comes from, and kind of like what we're doing with it. Um, and so I would love to see, uh, oh, excuse me, I would love to hear and know um, uh, some more specific things in, in your, your works and projects um, about what you're doing with it. You, Will, you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but Cherise, can you tell us a little bit about like how you, uh, or any specific work that you have done or are planning to do that you're saying, okay, this is what I really want to do. Yeah, um, I like that um, with the performance um, earlier, uh, the inclusion of the pointing, because for me, I see writing as a form of dance as well. In fact, the word choreography means to write the circle. So it's writing the, the ritual of the ring shout, the circle. And writing for me is similar in a sense of it's a kind of looping, a coming back to oneself over and over again. So a lot of my current work is exploring the idea of the, the dance of writing. And um, so I just completed uh, my first full-length uh, manuscript called uh, And the Water Breaks, 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 uh, An Automythic Error. And for me, it's the idea of the personal, like, psychopomp journey of my mind and dancing with words and breaking words down to get to a certain sense of myself. So um, I love playing with words, and that's you see that throughout my book. And I feel like that is a part of the lineage of um, Afrofuturism and the African diaspora is our playing with words, because that gave us a sense of liberation. And uh, uh, mainstream culture will define that uh, as us breaking the language. But that was our empowerment, taking our collision with um, Western society and creating something out of that breakage. And um, so a lot of my work mimics that um, incorporating breakage and recreation and forming something new out of that. Um, I'm also uh, at a residency on Governor's Island um, with Works on Water and I'm exploring um, the effects of water on language. Um, my project's called Mutungs, and so it's playing on um, mutation, as well as various water myths, uh, like the land of Mu, and so, um, and also incorporating the idea of movement. So, Mu, 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 Mu. Um, so, I'm trying to see how um, water and movement and fluidity affects sound and language and how we can have a more liberatory um, language through movement and sound. Yeah, that's mostly what I'm working on right now. <laughs> I, 
I do have another project <laughs> that I am working on. Uh, this project is called Black Alchemy, uh, and it's BLK Alchemy. Um, this is actually an artist collective, and this is an artist collective of black artists, specifically um, a balanced collective, which is half uh, women, half men. And the purpose of such is to create exposure to the presence of black art. Uh, a lot of times it's, it seems like a subculture of other art, uh, which in and of itself diminishes the Afrofuturistic aspect of it. So uh, giving it a more prominent role is something that I'm dedicated to doing. So Black Alchemy is another project that I'm actually working on. And it's funny because a long time ago, I used to dance, but not like, not like your dance, like it, your dance is like the real deal. Um, but so I, I, I definitely see how the relationship with the, uh, the, the positioning that you, you brought to what I said. Um, but yeah, that's currently the project that I'm, I'm working on. So there's Black Alchemy, Our Black Web, and Melanating. And all of these things are all about, again, positioning and making sure something is there that uh, can help foster growth. Black Alchemy will uh, span from just a visual collective to an agency and from an agency to an EDU. And, and that's how I see growth. It's taking knowledge. It's almost like the uh, griots from the past who would take certain knowledge and then they would orate it, pass it along as generations went forward. And that's what I'm trying to create with these systems that I've been building. Systems building, um, it's very interesting as well um, because it, it also, it, indicates uh, a passing on which is inherently built within this futurism uh, of kind of which we're speaking um, can we talk a minute for uh, any isms that have been passed on to you both specifically um, or that you possibly uh, uncovered within your own work or from yourselves over time uh, and how and how important that has been to you know either unpacking uh, your own personal narrative um, the the um, community around you uh, your family personally and kind of that's that impact uh, moving forward um, for me it was okay so I <laughs> What, what spurred me into what I do currently is 100% my mother. That's where it came from. Um, and I'll never forget when I was a child, she brought uh, my cousins and I into the dining room and she started drawing on like line paper. And I had no idea what was going on, but I was amazed, right? So she planted a seed there. And then the second seed she planted was, no one's better than you and you could do anything you put your mind to. So that stuck with me as I got older and it grew with me as I grew. So I started to become very self-aware when I started to analyze things that were happening around me, whether they were to me or to other people or to the community in general, which helped me realize that uh, there are several factors that hinder us in terms of our advancement. Uh, and again, Afrofuturism to me is about advancement and positioning. So when I look at things, I realized one of my biggest faults was comparing. And I would always find myself comparing my current positioning and point to somebody else's current positioning and point. Not looking at the road they may have traveled to get to the point that they're currently at and comparing that to my own journey, which was something that I shouldn't have done. And I feel like that is very impactful. Uh, to us as a people because it limits our ability to see where our own future lies and how to progress in that direction. Um, so that comparison also led to a certain self-doubt despite that original seed that was planted. So removing that self-doubt was the, uh, the second thing that I had to do and uh, figuring out that what I'm doing is good enough and it can be more and that led to my third thing, which was consistency. Because inconsistency was probably the biggest factor in killing my growth. Um, I would do something, I would do it well, and then I would never do it again for a long period of time. 
there was a period of time when I was in college, I did not draw for 10 years straight, like just stopped, didn't. And if you add up that time, that's a significant amount of time I could have used to grow my craft, advance, get to a certain position and level that to this day would have been completely different. Um, so there are a lot of things that um, I feel isms wise that I adopted, that I was able to learn from. And now I try to pass those things down. So when people ask in regards to things that I'm currently doing, how I got to this point, how I may have progressed, I give those to those people because I feel like whether they're a generation younger or they're the same age, it's still an upcoming. So I use that as my means of passing that information on and building growth. I think for me, the entry point for what I do was strangely growing up in the Pentecostal church. Um, and for me, it's it was strange because I didn't believe in a lot of the dogma of Christianity, but I appreciated a lot of the ritual aspects of being in the church, like the dance, the music, the speaking in tongues. And so for me, a lot of me seeing outside of the dogma was, in a sense, allowing myself to question things and question systems that were already there because oftentimes in the church they don't allow you to question things and so um, I started to basically go read things on my own and through that I it started to break down the door of knowledges that existed previously to a lot of the dogma that has been created for people's agendas who basically are not us and don't have our um, best um, in mind. So um, I started to explore like ancient African systems, um, ancient African languages, seeing how like a lot of that influenced our current culture. Um, as I said before, I love etymology and like breaking down words and looking at their sources, I found um, a lot of them would relate to words from the East, from either Asia or Africa. And um, we don't explore that. We think of like our current language as it's just current, like how you have certain people in this country who will tell you to speak English. And it's like, you don't even know where your English comes from. <laughs> so like, for me, like breaking that down and breaking language down and breaking down the idea of this kind of current idea of language that there's a longer history to the words we speak every day. Um, that thinking of like Sankofa, which, you know, I have a tattoo on my back. Um, the West African Ankin symbol that you have to go back and fetch it. That, um, that the key to our future is often going back and finding the source of things because that will really open the door for opening our minds and our bodies to what really is. And that basically has informed me for the past few years, yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, for for much of this, um, uh, and it's, it's very interesting in the sense that we're, we're getting ready to watch a performance uh, for those that did uh, see the performance and for those that are uh, coming uh, to attend. Um, and the irony that we're in a sculpture garden in the sense that almost all of these pieces are static or fixated in some sense, but that actually force us to move. I think that's the very uh, interesting irony about sculpture in itself, in the sense that to see the completeness of the piece, we as ourselves actually have to move. At other times we can see with uh, the Silk River it, itself, it, it moving circumstantially, you know, with nature and with the wind. Um, and so, in this relationship to uh, movement, um, and then in the trajectory of, of our own narratives uh, in this diaspora for our for ourselves as um, people of African descent, but then for for others as well with your own lineages, I think that's where dance and this idea of performance really starts to uh, 
I guess, the, I mean, you kind of said the word earlier, break, uh, and kind of like bringing in, you know, Fred Moten and this idea of being in the break. But it does kind of create this break or like this casse, which allows us to go back and see like, ah, this is actually what brought me here. Oh, this is actually what created now this system of, you know, of operating or of doing. Um, if you can talk about that really quickly, uh, you know, in the sense that, you know, dance and performance kind of gives us this literal view of bodies moving in and through space. Um, and how is that, um, in a way, is that a part of your work? Is that something you think about? This idea of moving across time? And if so, how and, and why is it important to you? Yeah, I actually think about um, movement a lot in relation to writing because writing on the page is often seen as this kind of fixed thing. And um, even when we think of like religious texts like the Bible, the word, it's this fixed thing, but in actuality, it's something that has been constantly moving and changing over centuries. People either like re, re writing it, retranslating it, um, combining different elements together, it's not something that's fixed. And that's writing in general for me. So I often like to break my own text a lot. And um, I have a installation idea that I'm working on um, where basically I'm taking my own words and breaking them into pieces and I, ask other, I invite other people to come and recombine my words into their own work. And so I'm inviting them to, in a sense, dance with me with my own words and come up with something new. So for me, the way I keep myself from, in a sense, becoming fixed or static, I, I break myself, I break my words, I, invite, I open myself up and I see breakage as opening myself up to invite others in and that allows for further connection and growth. I think um, for me, it's, it's cyclical. So I'm thinking of the movement in terms of a certain rhythm, a pacing, and um, keeping a certain flow. And I'm, my background is in mechanical engineering and at, as well as the design aspect. So I'm gonna use those as examples. Uh, so we see mechanical engineering around us every day, mechanics everywhere. So even in body motion, vehicles, uh, the way the water moves, everything is mechanics and how it operates, right? So when things are moving in tandem and correctly, everything moves smoothly. But there can be things that are set up that impede that flow, uh, whether you don't have enough oil in your car, uh, your transmission seizes, any number of things. Uh, and now I'm, I'm going to jump into coding. So I don't know if you've ever seen, everybody here probably uses a computer, so you, or your phone, right? There are lines of code in that that you don't see, but you know when it's working and when it's not. So you can tell when it's flowing correctly, and you're like, oh, this is going smooth, but then there might be an important thing, and you're like, why is this not coming up? Why is this not, why is my phone not turning on? Why is the battery draining too fast? Whatever it is, there's some kind of error when things like that are usually happening or something that you don't see that you can correct to fix that flow. Um, when you look at lines of code, let's say uh, a Windows or a Mac operating system, any one out of place item, a semicolon, a letter, can completely throw that entire code out of sync and make the entire thing stop working, right? So when I think again about the whole positioning aspect and the cyclical flow. It's all about making sure that everything is working in tandem. And with, again, and I keep saying this because to me systems are important. Uh, the systems I'm building and working on are to help feed each other so that they keep that flow going. And then they work independent of any outside sources. But it's all about making sure that the rhythm is consistent, the flow is continuous, and that there's nothing that's interrupting that in between. Cool. Um, 
for this last 10 minutes, I would love to open it up for questions from audience. Um, when we think about, after, just to give uh, kind of a segue for us, if anyone does uh, want to start a conversation or um, dialogue with us, because I mean, we would really love that. Um, but uh, so much of this uh, work that we're doing um, does develop from a personal standpoint, and it really does have to do with us taking our elders, our family, our peers, but especially our ancestors with us as we move forward or as we work to bring, uh, as Will is saying, this idea of uh, cyclical energy and movement in this continuum, which allows us to pass back into uh, almost like a zero point and then for allowing us to begin again. Um, so has that been important for anyone in, in, uh, out here in your life or uh, how have you been able to consider where you are now and your future based on kind of like your own lineage or your family narrative or the narrative of your community or the narrative of uh, what has been passed down to you and you know how has that been important um, in allowing uh, allowing for you know you to have like kind of an everyday sense of purpose if you will or is, or is that something that's important Pardon me? Just a really little question. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Sorry, it's a little big. Well, I guess uh, if anyone would have a question for us on um, kind of what does it mean to uh, take what was uh, passed down to you with you forward? Because that is a big tenant, if you will, of Afrofuturism. That's a uh, that's like a major part of what and why this movement exists. So is it important that you were given something and as you move forward, why is that important? So holding our past in the present with us right now. And that's, I mean, that's absolutely correct. Um, for the piece that uh, we performed and that you'll see today, again, Ephemera is talking about this celestial wayfinding that uh, enslaved Africans use to navigate their path to freedom. Um, there's a, uh, a spiritual, uh, follow the drinking gourd. I don't know if anyone knows of the spiritual, uh, but the drinking gourd is specifically what is known as also the Big Dipper. And so from the bottom star of the Big Dipper, if you connect five paces below in any direction, no matter how, and funny enough, cyclically as it revolves with the earth, f five paces also evenly from that point always takes you to the North Star. And that's essentially the, um, the, the astronomy that enslaved Africans actually used to read the night sky, to take them to freedom, uh, to find their own path of liberation. And so, you know, what you just said about holding the past with us in the present is exactly what this work is doing and what this work is, is trying to do. Uh, Cherise just earlier mentioned uh, the pointing, which you will see in the choreography. Um, really notice how we incorporate the pointing throughout the work, but then especially with uh, the Silk River, uh, the sculpture that's right here that traverses from and kind of snakes through the park. Uh, for me, I was considering it as a constellation connecting and this idea of how do you then trace these elements for yourself or in, in relationship to what you were also saying, how do you then connect these words? How do you then allow them to be broken down and rearranged to really create a system? You know, as Will is saying, for those that might understand code or, or know um, those systems of technology, just like any other language, of when the rules work and when they don't, and when it breaks, you know, what that means and what comes next. Can I just add something yeah. real quick? I just want to touch on the, uh, the present aspect that you just spoke on. Um, I think 
for a lot of black people, the concept of seeing themselves in the future didn't exist at a point. And so that is why it's more of a prominent thing within the Afrofuturism aspect for them to see that. And it's mainly because when you are stuck in conditioned to accept a certain way of living or being, you no longer see yourself in that future. So it became important uh, for a lot of people conceptually to start thinking of ways to break out of that box and to see themselves in the future. Whatever those systems were, whatever they were developing, um, these are two perfect examples right here. And uh, the present is absolutely a thing that's necessary, but it also needs to be combined with the future aspect because you need to know where you stand now in order to understand how you can get to that point in the future, so. And also thinking about throughout the diaspora, time is also not really seen as linear. It's often seen as circular and um, the future is now, the past is now. It's all present at the same time. So when we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about what we're doing now that can impact what's going to come and how to pull in what has happened already and bring that to what is now. So I feel like it's all connected anyway, yeah. Question, yes. The question was in, um, beautifully stated. In this analogy of constellations uh, being synonymous uh, or equating it with road maps, you know, or finding point A to point B to C, um, what is something right now that we're doing on an everyday that we would consider um, a road map for futuring? Um, any of you want to take that? I think a lot of the roadmaps we have are within our bodies already. Um, a lot of our culture holds a lot of stored memory that we have, whether it's through our dances, through our songs, through the way we talk. Um, a lot of that is history that is packed in there. And I feel like if we examine that and explore that more, that can take us forward and we can grow that into our future, yeah. If I were to touch on that aspect, um, we also know that DNA stores a lot of information and data. Um, and that can be one, one of the main things that we discuss when we talk about that storage is generational trauma. Um, but there are also the positives that are stored that we can then access and figure out how to navigate and get from point A to point B. We also have examples uh, that we need to pull from. Nothing that um, we create today, I mean, there are original things, but we all use some form of foundation that has pre-existed in order to get us to another point. Uh, whether it's building upon something that somebody has created. You may create a dance or a movement sequence that somebody is going to look at and say, okay, how can I improve upon this and make this better and get to this point? Uh, same thing for anything that you're doing in terms of your research. Uh, so I feel like it's focusing on what we have internally and these things that we can learn from to roadmap to the future as well as things that we already see. There could be people here who already have things established that after speaking to them, you would learn they took a certain path and then, hey, now you have a path that you could take. You didn't know that path was there until you spoke with that person. So it's about learning where you can access that information from, uh, just like you would go to a meet and greet, find certain people there with similar interests 
uh, similar paths that they're going, but they may have a certain idea of how to navigate and get to that point. And I feel like those are uh, important factors we got to take into consideration in order to navigate and get to where it is that we want to be. So I feel like that would answer the question that you asked in terms of roadmaps and how to get from one place to another or how to access them. Um, I guess to close, because uh, we're going to get ready to begin the, uh, the, the final performance for this afternoon. Uh, but to answer the question on what are the roadmaps uh, that we are uh, on or that we are using um, to c create these futures, I think w right now is an example um, finding convivial spaces, creating spaces where we convene and we actually celebrate our uniqueness, where we actually celebrate our stories that brought us here. And you, we actually affirm the presence of those narratives, no matter how hard or how uh, light, um, but the, the fact that it's like, okay, yeah, we're here right now to convene. I, and I think the strategically creating those spaces is this is, is part of that system i think that that's you know the strategic creating of those spaces is the uh uh you know oh yes opening up a park to make sure that site-specific performance can happen but then it's also saying okay yeah this community garden is also going to exist we're going to also make sure that fresh food and vegetables can somehow some way be accessed in this food desert um yeah, we're gonna make sure that uh, you know what you know, Menenga. It really needs to the because in this park, okay, you know, we, we're gonna make sure that this happens right here because the elders might really need some exercise and they really just might need to see each other. And across generations, the youth really might need to just talk with some grandparents and just create that space. And I think that that's that's part of the systems that are, are that kind of create these roadmaps or these connections, these constellations, if you will. Um, so I think that can kind of uh, segue us into preparing for the performance in the next, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I really want to thank Socrates Sculpture Park uh, for just, first of all, commissioning uh, myself, uh, Renegade, Andre Zachary, Renegade Performance Group to create this work. Um, Again, thank you to Black Speculative Arts Movement um, for linking us, uh, connecting me with Will. Cherise, I've known for now almost five years. Um, to have this space, to, again, to engage with you all. Um, yeah, we, we thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we're here next week as well. Again, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Please tell people it's free. Um, again, the ferry is a nice ride, a way to kind of come. It's very relaxing. Uh, and then finally, uh, our social media handles. I'm uh, at Renegade PG uh, on Instagram and Twitter. You can find me there. Please contact me, uh, RenegadePG.com. Uh, and then finally, it does actually take a village to kind of support what we're doing. Uh, we have a donation table where you, you can contribute to the culture. Um, the donation table is at the Broadway entrance. Uh, at the uh, entrance of the park next to the uh, the welcome uh, the welcome center, uh, please consider making a contribution. Any level uh, is impactful and makes a difference. Um, yeah, but thank you. Uh, I'll let Cherise and Will give their Instagram and uh, social media handles as well, so you can follow them. But yeah, it, please uh, take as much video as you like today with the performance. Just at us, share, spread the word, and we we truly appreciate it. Thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Andre, for having us. Um, thank you, Will. It's been great. And um, you can um, find me at Instagram and Twitter at A Future Ancient. And again, thank everybody for paying attention and staying alert. Uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Sharice. I appreciate you both. My Instagram and all social media is all spelled out. No funny symbols or anything. The one will focus the one will focus on all social media easy to remember all right and thanks again i appreciate you